Well, we are having such a great conversation with Crystal Oriata that I have asked her to add to what she was just speaking about and to speak about how development from within a community might work differently than the current way that development is being done. Crystal, would you share about that? Yeah, I think this is such an important way of, of thinking about how do we build our community, basically looking at um, community asset mapping and looking at what are the resources and the assets that the community already holds and how do you continue to pour into them and elevate them? Because when we look at industry or businesses that are actually entrenched in the community, they tend to operate differently than um, businesses, big box businesses that really have no ties to the community and why it's really important to me, not only do we grow small, small businesses, small minority owned businesses, but also those small minority owned businesses that are entrenched in the community where they, this is the community that they live in. This is the community that they pay taxes in. This is the community that their kids are growing up in because they're more invested in the ecosystem around them. And it's evident in the way that they move and the way um, that they build their, their organization or they build their business. And it runs a lot deeper, like their employees and even their customers are just not seen as that. Um, they're really invested in the growth of their community and the growth of their employees. And so I've worked with, um, for example, some small businesses that are, are run by returning citizens and they create these opportunities where a lot of these individuals didn't have opportunity to work in a lot of places because of their past. It was very hard for them to get a job. And so they started, uh, one started a clothing line business and then just opened up like an inter entertainment space in their community. But the opportunity to one, hire other returning citizens to one mentor them into how to create this business was as good as business model look like and how to run a business and even if they don't get into the same industry they can lean into whatever skill set that they have and so i think it's so important that when you're pouring into these types of businesses where they have a sense of community that is creating an opportunity to do more than just even create jobs for people, but to reshape and reimagine our community as, as a whole. Another great organization um, that I work a lot with is Life After Release. It's a nonprofit organization. And it's run by a woman who's also a returning citizen, Kiana Johnson. And she hires, I think 100% Black women. And a lot of them are returning citizens, not all. And if not, um, most of the people that are hired have been touched by the incarceration system, uh, maybe a loved one. Uh, one of the amazing organizers that I work mostly on a daily basis with, her son um, was going through something they, and they, they met through participatory defense, teaching the community how to defend yourself in a courtroom. And then never had been an organizer before, got involved because you know she needed to do something for her family and now is the organizing coordinator for this nonprofit. And that was because it's being led by someone that's been impacted by the community. Um, and they understand that this is an opportunity to change the fabric of their community by hiring people that live in the community, hiring people that are directly impacted, making sure they have a skill set that can be translated into other industries. And that's why I think it's so, so, so important that when we're building our nonprofits, when we're building our small businesses, that we pour into them, um, the ones that are specifically minority owned and in direct are being led by people that are directly impacted by whatever you know, cause that they're fighting for, because when they're leading it, they lead it from a different angle. And when they're running it, they're more thoughtful in ways um, that big boxes aren't or people that are not entrenched in the community aren't thinking about. And so that has to be part of the conversation around um, community-based development, because sadly, a lot of the resources on the county level, when we look at our economic development corporation, where we have invested 
upwards of $50 million that are supposed to go to building businesses. If you go look at who gets those funds, it's not a lot of small minority businesses that are getting them. And it's definitely not a lot of businesses that are even, the owners are local to Prince George's County. They live in the county. So if we reshape that program, one of the things I would advocate for if elected is that we really have to look at incubator and startup funds. That is crucial because a lot of these programs are built on, you have to have like a track record of two to five years. You have to have X amount of income to even get funding. Um, but that is a hurdle for a lot of businesses that uh, are led by people of color. And the reality is they don't have the entry level capital to start their business. So if you looked at having a grant program for, you know, the companies that need a small capital, somewhere between uh, 10 to 30,000, that's small capital, right? For some businesses, because you're not, those are not businesses that maybe they need a storefront where you're talking upwards to like 50 to 100,000 um, capital to start up, but those are like your on online retail businesses, you know, maybe you're starting a food truck business, you know, starting a clothing line business where you could do it with, you know, 10 to, uh, 30,000 capital. And that's where we spend money. And so you don't need to prove that you have, you know, X years of business, X years of revenue. You could say, I just have a business plan, a model and a skill set. And we have to look at it as, you know, most small businesses, there's, we know that there's a cutoff that not all are going to succeed. And the problem is that we are look at our investment as only ones that are already successful to amplify. We don't invest, right? Invest meaning there is some risk that not 100% of them are going to be able to be sustained. But the investment of the ones that are able to sustain and grow yields such more of a benefit, such a return on our investment, because we are changing, we're creating generational wealth for communities. We're creating opportunities and mentorship for um, people in their communities to see people being able to smart start small businesses and grow. So it changes the mentality of your community to just looking at what you can obtain and what you can have. Uh, and then it's creating opportunities for them to create jobs and in our community, because if they're able to grow and amplify, then they're able to hire. And that is when you see like the trajectory of a community where you can go from, okay, I got to do everything. I can't afford to bring on employees to when you're able to grow and expand. And I think that's the opportunity that we need to shift with our economic development corporation funds as a county. And then also, I think we have to shift our nonprofit funds because part of it, when we talk about community-based development, is also nurturing and growing and expanding our nonprofit structure. But sadly, a lot of our dollars for our nonprofit structure go outside of the county. There was a huge scandal where we were giving majority of our money to DC um, based on profits, uh, or we don't give a lot of resources to BIPOC led nonprofits, and we don't give a lot of resources to the nonprofits on the ground doing the majority of the work. Um, I can speak for our, myself as an executive director of a nonprofit. To date, we have not a dollar from the county. None of the, re none of the work that we have done. Um, has been funded by the county in any way, shape, or form. And we're talking about, um, I think we've served over a thousand residents, groceries. Um, we've done hot meals. We've done clothes giveaway. We've done COVID testing. Uh, we've done, when there was a fire in the community, giving the like, toiletries, you know, doing pop-ups, just get meals. When families have lost people, covering funeral services um, for families. And, None of that work has been funded by the county. And there's a lot of amazing organizations that are doing the same, that they either have reached into their pocket to get off the ground to fund everything that they're going to do, or it's outside forces and foundations that are funding them. So we have to ask ourselves, then where we have millions of dollars, millions of dollars in grant funding that goes out in the county every year. So you have to ask yourselves, where is that funding going? Who are they funding? Uh, like in the organizations like Life After Release, like I mentioned, Guns Down Friday, does amazing work with youth trying to stop gun violence in our community. Don't get funding. 
they're out here doing everything in their pocket or by outside forces and foundations um, that see them or generous donors that are individuals. Um, but the what I call the uh, nonprofit industrial complex that we're dealing with um, tends to grow and they tend to get funding. And it's just about, you know, oh, who do you know? And you know the right person, you get funding. And it should shift, like it should be more community centered. It should go to the organizations that are entrenched in the community, actually doing the work. They're the ones that should be shepherding the, um, the decision-making. And one of the good things that a lot of foundations have moved to, which I think the county should, when you talk about community-based development, is they call it participatory funding. And so it's where they bring in the community, like it's a, a but they usually bring in um, either small, if it's a fund for nonprofits, they bring in nonprofits that are local, um, that are grassroots, and they review the applications. It should be similar for the Economic Development Corporation. If you want to invest in small businesses, you should bring minority small businesses to the table, startups diversified, right? And they're part of the decision-making on how we're spending these resources, how we're investing these funds, because that way there's more accountability than just elected officials and people with power and the people that can just continue to give money to who they know, but actually the communities at the table directly impact the stakeholders at the table of deciding how we spend the resources, the capital, the taxes that we're paying into, because this is our money, right? So we should be at the table deciding how we spend these dollars. So I think there's an opportunity. Uh, one of the biggest campaigns that we're launched here at PG Changemakers is participatory budgeting. And so the idea for us is that we want to engage in community in the budget process, want them to understand the steps, how it works. We're launching a survey of asking residents how would they like dollars invested, how would they like the money spent, um, depend around different departments, where should we increase, where should we decrease our spending and our budget. And then we could go armed to the county council and to the county executive and say, hey, this is what the community wants our tax dollars spent on, not just myself or, you know, our organizers, but we, our goal is to get thousands of residents to participate in these surveys annually so that, and then to break it down by demographics so you can see, you know, this community over here in this district would like money spent this way, over here, this part of the, the county, they're leaning towards seeing money spent this way. So then it also allows us to see, okay, you know, where are communities hurting? Where are the issues that are more important to them? And then allows us also to say, for our different departments and agencies, okay, this, this community needs a lot of assistance from DPI. Like a lot of what they're looking at is around, you know, maybe in, you know, inspections or you have like uh, slumlords, you know, that are not fixing up these apartments at the rate that they should be. So we need more inspections here in this community to make sure that there's enforcement that these communities are not, you know, suffering. Like we see a lot of that, like in Langley Park and places like that, where you have a lot of um, management companies that are having communities live in deplorable situations. They have no intention of fixing up their community, the, the facilities, because the idea is they want to force people out so that then they can remodel and then they could charge more. Um, and they don't want the people to stay in those conditions. So they'll make them as bad as possible um, to force people to leave. And that's where enforcement comes in, right? And all of this is part of community-based development. And that's why when I started, I said, it's a more complicated and, you know, conversation and it, and it touches so many things because what you're saying is that as we develop and grow our community, that we want the community's needs wants to be at the center of it. And that means every single thing that you're doing, you're rooting it back to what does this community need? And what does this community want? And it has to be looked at from community to community. You can't say that this is the model, it works, we shove it in every community because it takes that um, thoughtfulness 
to look at every single community and ask every single community, what do you want your neighborhood to look like? What is the needs of your community? And no, it's gonna change, right? From zip code to zip code, from municipality to municipality, from district to district, and that's okay. Um, but I think the issue is that a lot of people don't wanna do that hard work. The hard work of needs assessments, the hard work of reaching out to their community, the hard work of understanding what that community in particular wants their neighborhood to look like. And that's the approach that I think we have to change. We have to, to drill down from neighborhood to neighborhood. We have to bring the community to the table and we have to be thoughtful about every single piece of development that's in our community from businesses to our school system, to our housing, to the infrastructure, everything um, should be hand in hand with the government and the community to ensure that um, everyone's thriving and everyone's taken care of. If we wanna tackle safety, if we wanna tackle unhoused population, if we wanna talk about um, making sure we have prevailing wage, if we want to talk about fixing the unemployment rate, all of that starts with community-based development, because you don't even know the issue of your community if you haven't talked to your community. So then you can be, you're so far from the solutions of what that community needs. That was great. That was great. Yeah. Um, 